I want to kick off the questions first by turning to the panel and saying, after hearing the opening statements, I feel as though I'm hearing two teams debate two entirely different worlds. One in which, um, in, in one world, in one of these worlds, prostitutes are workers. In the other world, prostitutes are captives. In one world, prostitutes have free choice. In another world, prostitutes have no choice whatsoever. And I, especially given the, the description that you left us with, Sydney, of, of you're talking about young women making choices, I want to ask anybody from the opposing side to, to address that point with Sydney on the, on the matter of choice, particularly Catherine. You had said that there really is no free will if you are a prostitute. It is never your choice. I would like you to address that or any of your teammates to the other team. I didn't say what you just said. I said that um, it's always in a context of sex inequality in which your options are precluded to begin with. And as Melissa pointed out, uh, there's a dramatic mm. amount of racial and class-based bias uh, in the people who are actually in this industry. Um, and, you know, prostitution is, is what women do when all else fails, and all else fails often. And there are a lot of things that men do in general when all else fails, and prostitution is not that thing. And that means this is an institution of sex inequality. It is. And you know, when, but I would also note uh, that we actually agree uh, with, uh, that is, Ms. Barrows and us uh, concur in the view that the sold in this, the women, the girls, uh, when they are boys or men, uh, should not be criminals. Uh, they should be, the, the prostituted people need to be decriminalized firmly. That is the Swedish model. And it's the buyers who we're here to talk about the Johns that Melissa described, um, and whether what it is what it is they are doing when they are buying people. Your teammate, Melissa um, I, I would like to quote uh, to respond to what Sydney said and quote from her book, which is, she said, a call girl is simply a woman who hates poverty more than she hates sin. I would use the word prostitution and not sin. So I would say a call girl is simply a woman who hates poverty more than she hates prostitution. I think that's the whole point we're making here. That shouldn't be the choice. If we're seeking an end to inequality between men and women, if we're seeking an end to violence against men and women, women should not have to make the choice between poverty and education paying the next month's rent and prostitution. From the other side, Lionel Tiger. I'm sorry that this whole discussion now is focused on prostitution. I thought that what we were talking about was the economics of human sexuality. And that is really the parsimonious fundamental issue that we have here. People engage, and I mentioned the engagement ring uh, in marriages, which have immense responsibilities to the next generation, to communities, to relatives, to uh, friends, and we're somehow putting the immensely complex and, uh, and both luxurious and difficult business of being an adult lover into the same rubric as prostitutes who, and I think there's an argument to be made that it, yes, it's terrible. Now we're starting to hear how this all expresses uh, sexual inequality and racial inequality. Please, let's try to limit the discussion to the subject of human sexuality and stop uh, including every single uh, allergic category that comes into these uh, discussions. Wendy Shalit, Wendy, yeah, Wendy yeah. Shalit, what, what, what Lionel is doing is saying that buying a diamond ring is paying for sex. Do, and to yeah. I think it's actually um, the negative team that is equating, uh, in equating marriage and dating with paying for sex. The negative team is conflating things that should not be conflated. First of all, in prostitution, there's no shared desire, right? Which means one person is an object. That's a big difference. Um, also, marriages in which there is a transactional element, in which it's okay, you give me this, I'll give you this, there's a 50-50 exchange of services, um, end up failing precisely because that's not what a marriage is, right? But I want to address the free 
choice issue because Ms. Barrow said that she doesn't recognize any of the girls <clears throat> or the men. So I just want to refresh her memory um, because I, I thought her, her book was really interesting. And she said, quote, quite, quite a few of the new girls that she used had no money and nothing appropriate to wear. So I would take them to Saks and charge whatever they needed on my credit card. They would pay me back from their future earnings. When she found a fabulous ground floor apartment for her office, which was super cheap, the rate was made up for by making her girls sleep with the landlord, who she said was only interested in one thing and lived in a seedy, semi-furnished apartment and made them feel cheap. Um, she says the girls weren't crazy about the plan, and really one can see why. Um, is that free choice? That doesn't sound like empowerment to me. To me, empowerment comes from actualizing your unique potential in the world. That's what empowerment is. <clears throat> Realizing you're unique and you have a unique contribution to make to this world. Not being forced to sleep with uh, a landlord to enrich somebody else's pockets, I'm sorry. Tyler Cowan, you want to come back to that? Our moderator is a very objective fellow. <clears throat> and what he's pointed out is that there are many different worlds here. And this is true. And what I would like you to do is to think through the implications of there being many different worlds. The other side is asking for a blanket condemnation of a practice. I'm asking you to see many different worlds, to understand this diversity of human preference, experience, and culture. And once we view the debate in those terms, in my view, the correct answer is to side with us, that there is no blanket condemnation. It is a diverse set of situations with many entirely acceptable outcomes, a lot of very bad outcomes. And the other side is simply pressing the emotional buttons again and again and again on the bad outcomes and trying to press all of our buttons. And I urge you to resist that to stand back, look at the bigger picture, and do not issue the blanket condemnation. Tyler, you're saying sometimes it's okay to pay for sex. There are many instances where the practice is badly regulated and we observe bad outcomes. Trafficking is an example. None of us are defending that, but that's not the proposition. Is it, to the other team, is, it ever, is there a sometimes where sometimes it's okay to pay for sex? Melissa Farley. Um, I, I would like to address this trafficked toddlers issue which is basically ranking victims. Um, when you decide that a battered woman is not really harmed because her arm wasn't broken, or a slave isn't harmed as much if they're in the house as opposed to in the fields, or a woman in prostitution is not harmed as much if she's a little older. And I'd like to tell you that a friend of mine who works in the field of child prostitution really to recently told me that there's now a move to only rank genuine victims of prostitution of children if they're prepubescent. So the age is always going down. We're always carving out some group that it's okay to use in prostitution. I think when we make these false distinctions, we are agreeing to set aside a class of human beings, the ones that make more, they're a little older, a little this, a little that. We're setting aside some people whose suffering we agree to ignore. 